This is an honor and a, a, a privilege and a, really a personal pleasure for me to welcome back Admiral James Davridis and to welcome for the first time, but a very dear friend, um, Mac McCarty. And um, I, I really can't thank them enough for being here with us tonight and being together there. They've known each other for a long time and we are absolutely in for a treat. So thank you both for coming. Just briefly, because I could go on for a long, long time um, about each of them and their background, their experience and, and their, their really, their worldliness. So, but just briefly, um, the Admiral has been, he served in the Navy for 30 years. He rose to the rank of four-star admiral. He was the Supreme Allied Commander at NATO, which is something that we will come back to, I'm sure, in the conversation, and commanded the U.S. Southern Command doing a lot of work in Latin America. He um, has been a dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. He's received his, uh, so many medals, it's really hard to even number them. He is on his 11th book, I think this is, and I'm gonna bring it up here. It is To Risk It All, Nine Conflicts in the Crucible of Decision. Um, we've had the pleasure of welcoming him to Brookhampton twice before. So this is really a, um, another treat for us. He's been um, an analyst at NBC News or a contributing editor for, for Time. He's now a vice chairman of the Carlisle Group and chair of the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. So we are in, very good hands. And Mac McCarty, equally distinguished, again, known him for 35 years. I first met him and his lovely wife, Donna, uh, when Mac joined uh, the Clinton and he back as an old friend of uh, President Clinton's from, uh, I'm gonna forget the name of the town, he's gonna correct me, but anyway, he's gonna remind me. Uh, and he was Clinton's chief of staff. So 35, 33 years ago, we were all in Washington, D.C. together. He went on to serve in various positions, diplomatic uh, positions in the Clinton administration and then on uh, in, in government. Um, he then founded in 1998, co-founded McClarty Associates, which is an international strategic advisory firm where he really roamed all over the world. So you, you'll see that we've sort of got the world at our hands and, and real depth of experience. And um, again, he's, he is one of the most well-traveled, distinguished and decent human beings I've ever met in addition to Admiral Stavridis who is, and I, I also have to say that Admiral Stavridis is an avid reader of both fiction and nonfiction. So he's endeared himself to Bookhampton. And this book of his is really brilliant. It's, a, it's also a wonderful read, people. And I don't say that lightly because um, it's a fascinating study about uh, men and women who serve um, this country roaming the seas to protect this country. And we start off with Captain John Paul Jones in the late 1700s, and we go all the way up to uh, COVID and, and Captain Crozier in 2020. And it really is an interweaving of history and biography and leadership and just um, what's referred to as a masterclass in decision making. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mac uh, and just sit back and enjoy this wonderful experience. And thank you again, both. Thanks, Carolyn. Carolyn, first of all, it is just Great to see you even virtually. Uh, it is a joy and a privilege uh, to have the opportunity to do this. One, to have an opportunity to be, Carolyn, with you. You have built something special with Bookhampton. You've always been a very astute business person and just a wonderful human being. And Donna and I so much treasure our friendship. We've traveled a lot of miles together, as you noted, and they all been good ones. You framed our discussion perfect, just perfect. And, you know, you don't normally use the word treat and honor together. One is kind of suggests lightness and the other is more seriousness and purpose. But in engaging tonight with Admiral Stavridis, uh, treat and honor are the right words, at least in my view. It is a treat, Jim, to be with you. Sure. And it's truly an honor. You have served our country with such dedication, honor, 
distinction and contribution. We're grateful for that. We're mindful of it. Carolyn noted it in her in her opening words. But you've continued to be such a strong, clear, impactful voice in your leadership in academia, uh, in business, and much more broadly. So it is just uh, just a rare opportunity to, to have this kind of engagement with you. You are a force, a force for good, a soldier, a statesman, a patriot, and I could go on. So let me start, if I may, Admiral, I want to just jump right into the book, because you had me with the Commander Ernest Evans and his yeah. lady episode, yeah. uh, and you had me with that great John Kennedy, President Kennedy quote at the beginning of your book. But before I do that, let me ask just a little bit about the personal side of Jim Snap Reeves. You talk about Laura as your North Star, which is touching and those of us who know you know it to be true. You talk very lovingly and so meaningfully and respectfully about your parents. Of course, you fathered, followed your father in service to our country, although he was part of the Marine Corps. So give us a little bit of texture of the Jim Servetus that grew up and then went to Annapolis and had this remarkable mm -hmm. career with passages ahead. Let's start there if we might. Well, that's so kind. And, and let me just add to your comments on Carolyn Brody, who is running a gorgeous gem of a bookstore. And I go there every summer when I'm visiting friends in the Hamptons. Of course, I can't afford a place there, but I'm happy to visit friends there. And uh, I, I get my stack of summer reading at Carolyn's and I have uh, presented there on a number of occasions. Um, what a, what a, beautiful space she has created there for those of us who are readers. So thank you, Carolyn. And Mac McClarty, national figure. I, I always say the president of the United States runs the executive branch, the chief of staff to the president runs the government. And that is the far harder task. And chief, if I may, uh, thank you for your service to our country. and. Uh, one of the most demanding jobs anybody could ever take on. Um, in terms of me, uh, you mentioned it already. I kind of grew up in a Marine Corps family. My dad, a proud Marine infantry officer who fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And I went off to Annapolis thinking, okay, I wanted to be an infantry officer like my dad. And I kind of held that in my mind through the first year at Annapolis. And then after your first year, we call it your plebe year, uh, that summer after that first year of college, you go out to sea. And I went out on a, a beautiful, relatively new guided missile uh, cruiser named the Jewett. And we set sail on a June evening to the west from San Diego, California, headed to Hawaii. And I got up on the bridge as the sun was going down. And remember, I'm a Marine Corps kind of guy. And I walked up there and I was told to take the helm of the ship. They taught me how to, how to drive this 9,000 ton ship. And I looked at that sun setting ahead of me, Mac, and I looked at all that light and all that water and I felt that ship kind of kicking under the wheel. And I thought, man, I wanted to be a sailor. And uh, I was like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. You know, the scales dropped from before my eyes and I wanted to be a sailor, a mariner. So I went home and told my dad all that. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, it was a little tense for a year, a decade, another decade. But then finally, when I pinned on my first star as a rear admiral, my dad said, yeah, maybe that was a pretty good call uh, following this, the sea. Uh, so that's a long way of saying I'm a sailor. And when I approach the idea of telling stories and trying to communicate ideas, I'm going to put them in that framework of the sea and of sailors. And so as I approach the book to, to talk about what it's like to make decisions under extreme pressure, the frame for me had to be the Navy and the Naval Service and this handful of nine individuals who have to make 
incredibly hard decisions in a moment when they have to risk it all. All of that came together in the book for me. Well, you can tell you still have that passion, dedication uh, to service. You fell in love that day. You got the got the, the wheel. Uh, you tell it with just such great sincerity and 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 just just in such a colorful, meaningful, lively way. And uh, you know, I, I thought your reference to your heritage and, and to Laura was just quite quite personal, and quite touching. Mac, can I add one thought to that? Because, you know, I'm Greek American and therefore I'm required to tell you something about my Greek heritage here. And, you and John uh, and, Negropathy, go ahead. <laughs> exactly, like John Negropathy. And, um, you know, people ask me sometimes, it's a good question, you know, what would surprise you about Jim Stavridis? And the answer is, I am a really, really, really good cook. And... <laughs> That is because my grandfather, who came to America as a refugee in the 1920s, he was a citizen of the Ottoman Empire, and the city of Smyrna, today Izmir, where he was born, was burned, and he escaped barely and married my grandmother, also a refugee, and they came to America in 1923, and he opened a restaurant. And if you've seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Diner, that was his restaurant. So really? I, I, yep. So I grew up around busboy, waiter, prep guy, line guy. I can run a line. I can walk into a small diner and run a line today. And I can cook anything around the Mediterranean. I can cook a, a Spanish a paella. I can cook a, a French cassoulet. I can cook an Italian risotto. I can make any kind of Greek food, obviously. I make a terrific tagine from North Africa, all learned from my grandfather's family and relatives growing up. So I'm very proud of the Greek side of my heritage, which is very different than being a sailor, just another dimension in, in the life that I've led. Well, an admirable one, and we'll add a soldier, statesman, patriot, and and cook to that, and, and all, <laughs> with, all with great pride, all with great pride. Yeah, and don't forget Dory Miller, one of the great right. characters oh, in yes, this the, book. Oh, yes, for cook. sure. Oh, yeah, I've got it right here, and we have time. We'll get to him as one of the chapters, but we may may have to compress, but that's why people need to buy the book and read it. It's a great read. It's just absolutely a great read. So, Jim, you've written 12 books. Uh, many have been bestsellers. One with Elliot Ackerman was a particularly unique book, but all of your books have been, uh, you, you told it, you're a great storyteller and a great communicator. So each of these books, kind of what inspires you? you? You gave us a little hint of that, but quickly tell us about that, and then we'll get right into the book. Yeah, in the early days of my book writing career, if you will, I wrote about what I knew and what I was experiencing. And that's what I'd recommend for anybody as you're starting off as a writer, write what you know. So for me, those were books about ship handling, about uh, weather at sea, about maritime operations, about naval operations. Eventually, as I became more senior in the Navy, the books expanded to kind of encompass geopolitics. I wrote a book about Latin America and the Caribbean, something a passion you and I share, um, after serving as commander U.S. Southern Command, my first four-star assignment in charge of all military activity south of the United States. Um, and then as I progressed through my NATO days and then into my current job, I wanted to share with readers what I'd learned along this voyage of life. And in many ways, this book, To Risk It All, which is about decision-making, is, is kind of the third book in a trilogy, Mac. And the first one was a book about leadership called The Leader's Bookshelf. Yep. And that's really a book about how you can become a better leader by reading, by putting yourself in the simulator, if you will, of mm -hmm. leadership. The second book was Sailing True North, 10 Admirals in the Voyage of Character, it's about character. And leadership and character are two very different things. Leadership is what we do to influence others. Character is how we lead ourselves. Character is that human heart. 
you know, the big door of leadership, you know this better than anybody, swings on the small hinge of character. So the second book in that trilogy, if you will, was Sailing True North. This is the third and final book in that trilogy. And it's about what I think are, is the third axis of what defines us. And that is the decisions we make under the hardest conditions. And, and that's where leadership and character become operationalized, if you will. So leadership, character, and now decision-making under risk. I think those are, are three things that have inspired me as a, a Navy officer and as an educator. And I poured myself into all three of those books, none more so than this one. Well, pouring yourself into it shows, Jim, as you read, as you read the book. You. Sure. Uh, knowing you as I do, your, your just great spirit uh, comes through in a number of ways in this book. But one of them that caught my real attention was how you talked about, wrote about each place that you and Laura had lived and you served our country, whether it was Pascagoula, Mississippi, or Annapolis, or uh, you know, in Afghanistan, or wherever the location was, the Pentagon, and so forth. And it just shows to me, not being solicitous, but just being admiring, that you're a giver, a contributor, and not a taker. You, you always Thank you. really engage with the community, the, the location, the people that you're in. And I, I loved your drive to Mobile to get to New York Times. <laughs> that was, was quite, a, quite, a, quite a story. So let me just really, if I may, jump right into the book. Sure. Uh, there, were, there was nine catatales, as you put it, nine, nine different passages uh, of certain situations and leaders and how they reacted, how they made decisions in the crucible uh, of the moment there. Uh, the hardest decisions that one really can be faced in life in so many ways. But I, I want to take three of them, if I may. First is a victory uh, with uh, Lieutenant Commander Decatur. And I, I love the reference uh, that Ernest Hemingway had, that hesitation increases in relation to risk in equal proportion to age. Yeah. And I thought of myself at Lieutenant Commander Decatur's age and now, and our two sons, but that was a victory. So, so give us a, a snippet, a preview uh, of that moment with uh, Lieutenant Commander Decatur, the Decatur House right across the way yeah. here uh, is named for him. You and I have been there many, many times, but uh, he had a great victory at a very young age. Yeah, an extraordinary figure. Stephen Decatur um, is one of these golden people. There was almost an aura around him. And he uh, became a hero in the war uh, with the Barbary pirates in the er early part of the 19th century. And the, the, the real story of Stephen Decatur begins when he is tapped as a, a very young officer to lead what's called a cutting out expedition. And this is where an enemy, in this case, the Barbary pirates, have captured an American ship. And they've got it tied up at the pier in North Africa. And Stephen Decatur is tasked with creating a mission to go in and literally cut the ship out, to cut the, uh, the, the, the ropes, if you will, the lines we call them in the Navy, that are holding the ship to the pier and pull the ship back to sea. So he's, he's in his early 20s at this point. And he's given this essentially national mission. I, I would compare it, Mac, to the mission to kill bin Laden. It's, it's an extraordinarily important mission for the national reputation of the United States of America. And he pulls together his, uh, his sailors and some Marines from the ships in the flotilla. And he puts them in these very quiet longboats. And they row their way into the quiet harbor in the middle of the night, and they approach this captive U.S. warship, and they jump on it, they seize it, they subdue the captors, and at that moment, the alarm is raised in the town, and all hell breaks loose. 
And this is the moment of maximum decision for Stephen Decatur. What is he going to do? Is he going to continue to try and cut those lines and somehow get way on the ship and get it out? Or is there a way that he can disable the ship so our enemies no longer have use of it and escape with his men? He chooses the latter course. He sets fires throughout the ship. He burns it to the gunnels. He escapes with every one of his crew members. It's an enormous success for the United States of America. At this point, a very young republic. And to your point, hey, it's a young man's game. He then becomes the youngest captain in the history of the United States Navy. It is a perfect example of age, your Hemingway quote, um, being something that when you're young and you're ready to take that maximum amount of risk, you can dive in and do it. Having said all that, I think the lesson of Stephen Decatur is audacity. It is the ability to take a chance. It is fortune favors the bold, as the Romans said. And Stephen Decatur really personifies that. By the way, ironically, he was on his way to becoming one of the, the preeminent figures in this nation when in that age of dueling Duel. yeah. and that, that high sense of honor, he is embroiled in a duel with a fellow naval officer and he dies in a duel very prematurely and, uh, and cuts short um, a life of extraordinary adventure. It's a really compelling story. And I think it's one of the anchors in the book. Well, it is. And spoiler alert, that duel might have had some uh, uh, uneven playing ground or uneven uh, land, landscape in, in the outcome of it. But that's you got to get the book to read it to, to find out more. But I think, uh, you know, Admiral Donna, my wonderful wife of 50 plus years, and I were so impressed and mildly surprised when Donna had the remarkable honor to christen the USS Maine, a nuclear submarine, when our friend Secretary John Dalton was Secretary of the Navy. It was the highlight of our lives in so many ways. But as we were on that ship with our two sons, when it went for a six-hour undersea voyage, which was, you know, for a layman like me, that was quite a, quite a, uh, quite an adventure. But how young so many of the crew members were, yeah. So dedicated to country, so well trained, so competent, but with senior leadership, you know, really steering the ship, so to speak, and conducting the affairs. But a remarkable look at the brave men in that case, now men and women in subs, as you know, uh, in our country. So quite, quite remarkable. Yeah, let I mean, me let me just yeah. add a, a two quick thoughts, if I may. Um, Stephen Decatur's fighting spirit sails on today in the form of USS Decatur, an Arleigh Burke destroyer, one of our beautiful Aegis destroyers, which was under my command in the Arabian Gulf. And uh, by the way, at the time, the captain of the Decatur was uh, a woman, a commander named Cindy Tebow, who went on herself to become an admiral and um, they performed mission after mission with enormous success in those hot steaming waters of the Arabian Gulf. I think Stephen Decatur must have been looking down from uh, the great harbor in the sky at the success of his namesake ship. Um, and by the way, my wife, Laura, like Donna, is lucky enough to be a sponsor. She is the sponsor of an Arleigh Burke destroyer, USS John Finn named after a Medal of Honor winner in World, in World War II in Pearl Harbor. So we know well exactly how meaningful that is for, uh, for Laura and for Donna to be a, a sponsor for one of these proud warships. So special, so special and what an honor. The second uh, cat of nine tales I want to pull out is, is Admiral Halsey, who's Halsey Hall you refer to on the Annapolis campus. Yeah. I thought you did quite a masterful job uh, pointing out where perhaps a lurch, as you put it, a decision made prematurely uh, cannot serve the process well, which was the case with Bull Halsey in, in the instant that you cite. But you do a masterful job of weaving back at the end of that chapter 
mm. uh, putting him in a, in a proper perspective of his overall leadership. But talk a little bit about slowing time down, as you talked mm. about, and the speed of decision making. And then we'll we'll go to what I was very fascinated as I we were chatting earlier uh, about uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Booker and uh, No Way Out. But let's talk about Admiral Halsey and, and the timing of decision making and maybe a misstep and how how serious that can be. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to like about Admiral Bill Halsey. The the press gave him the nickname Bull Halsey because he was you know sort of that fullback oh, always. Fullback. Fullback, yeah, yeah. Always driving for the line. He'd been a football player at Annapolis. Not a big guy, maybe five, nine and a half, not super tall, stocky, but very athletic, super competitive, and well liked by his contemporaries. And, and this is something I, I, I love about Admiral Halsey. He's still the oldest person ever to win the wings of gold, to qualify as a naval aviator. You know, the Top Gun in 50, too. Was in his 50s when he got his... Uh, he was. Wings. He was in his early 50s, which is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And I mean, it's the inverse of Stephen Decatur and a young yeah. man's game. And of course, Top Gun 2 is out and I highly recommend it. And you can drop a plumb line from Admiral Bill <laughs> Halsey to the, the spirit of Maverick and Goose out there. So here he is. He's in his 50s. He's a three-star admiral and Pearl Harbor happens through no fault of his own. Um, he happens to be in command of the fast carriers. And luckily for all of us, because we might be speaking Japanese right now, otherwise, uh, the carriers are out at sea when Pearl Harbor happens. The beautiful nine battleships, the heart, the beating heart of the Pacific fleet are destroyed. Arizona's sunk, it's still sunk. Uh, the others are all damaged, blown out of the water, settled on the bottom. These three carriers under Bill Halsey are the essential strike force of the United States of America on December 8th, 1941. Um, he then becomes this sort of quintessential fighting figure from 41, 42, 43, 44. He wins a lot of victories. He has some defeats, he has some missteps. Now the tide has turned and the United States is really in control of the battlefield, the, the sea field, if you will. And here we come to the Battle of Leyte Gulf. This is off the coast of the Philippine Islands, largest naval battle in human history. More ships, more sailors, U.S. Navy versus the Imperial Japanese Navy. Halsey makes a terrible decision. At the peak of this battle, he takes basically his entire striking force, his battleships, his cruisers, his carriers, and he runs to the north on what turns out to be a wild goose chase. He's been tempted into chasing after a chimera. He thinks the Japanese main fleet is to the north, and so he charges that way. It's quintessential bull Halsey. Uh, ride for the sound of the guns, make the reckless move, roll the dice, you know you'll win, fortune favors the bold, right? right. He right. goes off to the north. Unfortunately, that's exactly what the Japanese hoped for. And down on those beaches off the coast of the Philippines are the almost defenseless U.S. Navy landing ships full of right. Marines and uh, Army who are about to complete MacArthur's pledge, I will return to the Philippines. The only thing between that completely vulnerable landing force and the main thrust of the Japanese Imperial Navy, their huge battleships, their cruisers, their heavy guns are headed right at that landing force and could have killed literally tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Army and Marines. The only thing there are a group, a small group of destroyers, lightly armed destroyers. And these destroyers, by the way, Mac, weigh 1,500 tons. The Japanese battleship, for example, weighing down on them, the Yamoto, is 80,000 tons. Mm. And these destroyers charge the Japanese. 
they charged them and they launch torpedoes and they put up smoke and they fire their little pop guns and they are destroyed. The Japanese big guns blow them away. There's a whole backstory here. Uh, but in the Navy, we call that the last stand of the tin can sailors. Destroyers are tin cans because they're unarmored. They're like tin. And so, however, the Japanese are fooled. They're bluffed by these destroyers. They, they can't imagine that there are no battleships and cruisers and carriers behind them. So the Yamoto and the main battle force turns back. Meanwhile, Halsey, the reckless gambler, is just now realizing he has left his entire landing force unguarded, and he turns around and he sprints south. But for the rest of his life, for the rest of his career, he lives with a certain knowledge that if those destroyers, that handful of tiny ships, had not bluffed the Japanese force away, it would have been arguably the worst defeat in the history of the US Navy and maybe the US military. It's an extraordinary story of a gamble that goes incredibly wrong. And then Halsey is saved by the heroism of a handful of destroyer officers, by the way, one of whom won the Medal of Honor, first Native American to win the Medal of Honor, Commander Ernest Evans. He died, his ship was sunk, USS Johnston, that's an amazing story. We also talk about it in the book. Bottom line in all this, um, Bull Halsey, a lot to like about him, but part of his legacy, you must consider the enormous mistake he made and how lucky he was to walk away without a major disaster. Well, you talk about Commander Evans as you open the book. And exactly. You the book, you got a, you got a nine, and uh, my father, whose shoulders I'm still standing on it, business and much more broadly in terms of values and characters with my mother, but served uh, in that theater during World War II, both in Lady and Okinawa uh, as a U.S. Wow. captain, and um, that you know, makes, makes, one, makes one proud and grateful for sure. Let's turn to, to the most, <laughs> I think, intriguing chapter in the book, uh, passage in the book, No Way Out, Lieutenant Commander Booker, the Pueblo. This is truly being between the devil and the deep blue sea. Uh, you know, The No Way Out, many of us can remember that Kevin Cosner movie, right. same title. But this is a pretty remarkable story in a number of ways, including, including the, the uh, world-class squash player at the Naval Academy, <laughs> Jeff, Jim Stavridis, playing with your, you know, really someone you looked up to and admired, uh, Vice Admiral Hal Bowen. Yeah. And it was really interesting and telling to me how you told the story of, of Lieutenant Commander Booker and his crew and the excruciatingly difficult decisions he had to make. Excruciating. Yeah. You know, Hobson's choice, no good decision. Yeah. Uh, had to be made. Uh, destroying information there as best he could. But you disagreed with the conclusion of your older uh leader that you respected. So talk about that passage in your book. Yeah, yeah to, to really frame Lloyd Booker's tragedy, you have to go back to the victory of John Paul Jones, who opens the story. And John Paul Jones, I think many folks will know, was a Revolutionary War captain. He was in command of a beat up old US warship, the Bonhomme Richard. He takes on a British force that's much more capable, much more modern, um, off the coast of England in 1779. His ship, Bonham Richard, is being destroyed. It's being pummeled. It's on fire. The masts are falling. The crew is dying. The crew is literally begging Jones, John Paul Jones, to surrender the ship. The British captain calls across the distance between these two ships and says, sir, are you ready to surrender your command to strike your colors? And Jones utters those immortal words, sir, I have not yet begun to fight. I, there, there the determination, that sense that no matter what, 
a U.S. Navy captain will never give up the ship. And Jones incredibly turns the situation around. And in the book, we talk about how that can happen. And he defeats this larger British force and subdues the Serapis. And by the way, the next day, his ship actually sinks and he goes into port on the British ship, which he has captured. So park that and now, recognize now that. Go, now go to Booker's situation. Exactly. So go 200 years into the future, into the 1950s. And Booker is a captain of a U.S. commissioned warship, USS Pueblo. The problem is Booker's ship is an essentially unarmed intelligence gathering ship, very small, small crew, and they're operating in international waters off the coast of North Korea, listening, gathering information. Shamefully, the U.S. Navy has not provided overhead air cover. We don't have a destroyer escorting. We don't have a carrier strike group within range. We're just letting Lieutenant Commander Booker, who by the way himself is a former diesel submariner, um, is now in command of this intelligence ship. And we just let him do his thing because he's in international waters. We underestimate what the North Koreans might do. Unfortunately for Captain Booker and his crew, out come the North Koreans. They surround the ship. They start machine gunning it. Booker himself is wounded. There are casualties in the Pueblo. They can't get at their one offensive gun, which is a 50 caliber machine gun. It's a pop gun compared to what's pointed at them up on the forecastle of the ship. It's frozen. It's the middle of the winter. Any crew member who goes up there to even try and operate it will be immediately cut down by the North Koreans. And the North Koreans tell him, either you surrender your ship or we will sink it. And if there are any survivors, we'll machine gun them. I mean, it's, it, it is Hobson's choice to say the least. And so Booker, in violation of U.S. Navy regulation, because the U.S. Navy regulations say you will not surrender a ship if you have any means to resist. And that phrase is what becomes the turning point in this story. Anyway, Booker surrenders, believing, I would say correctly, that he had no means to effectively resist. And his crew become prisoners. They're tortured viciously by the North Koreans. Over a year later, they're finally released. Booker comes home. In my view, he should have gotten a hero's welcome. He comes home and the Navy court-martials him. Court-martials him because he violated Navy regulations. He gave up his ship. And, and some would say, including the, the three-star admiral you mentioned, Hal Bowen, who was the head of the court of inquiry into this incident, Hal Bowen would have said he should have fought with his rifles and his pistols. They had those. He should have fought with his fire axes. He should have let them sink the ship. That's his responsibility as a ship captain. I disagree with that because I think the phrase is, the means to resist. And so Booker gets court-martialed. Um, however, and I think this is a carriage of justice, um, he is ultimately pardoned uh, by the Secretary of the Navy and he retires uh, with his rank and his retirement pay. Uh, but it's a very controversial case in the US Navy. And it, to this day, it remains controversial and you'll find Naval officers on both sides of that argument. For me, um, I go with he did not have effective means to resist. But here's the bottom line, Mac. He was forced to risk it all. He was given no options by the U.S. Navy. He was not given the capability to resist. At the end of the day, the Navy failed him, not the other way around. But the point of including that story, and some have criticized me, for including that story. And, and they'll say, well, you know, all of these stories ought to be stories about someone who's made, you know, the right decision and done the right thing. And it turned out really well. And, and here, I think life is more complicated than that kind of cartoon version. I think that Lloyd Booker, in my view, made the right decision, didn't turn out well in terms of his career, but his crew lived, he lived, and I think he can hold his head high at the end of the day. 
complicated case. I think he risked it all, uh, but was not given the support he needed from the Navy. Well, I, I commend and admire your, uh, your, your decision, serious step or thought process, which you consistently have. It's a remarkable, complicated story. And uh, I just found it really riveting. I, I, and that's why I tried to balance a great victory, you know, a, a decision that, that could have resulted in disaster that still was perhaps a mistake and even certainly with the benefit of hindsight, a mistake at the time. And then a one that was right on the right on the knife's edge there, and, and and very difficult to fully assess. But I thought very very thoughtfully done. Matt, uh, can I can I just grab yeah. the mic for one second Please. and and grab one other character because her story is really successful. And and you know we talked about Decatur. His I mission know. was successful. But um, Halsey, really a reckless failed decision. Booker, controversial. Let me give you one really clean one where somebody makes a hard decision, risks it all, and it turns out perfectly. And that also is one that many listeners will have heard of because you probably saw the movie Captain Phillips about the rescue of the merchant Captain Phillips who was captured by Somali pirates off the coast of East Africa. And luckily for him, the US Navy was there. And there was a brilliant one-star admiral named Michelle Howard, happens to be African-American, first one-star African-American woman, by the way, went on to four stars, by the way. And the re reason she went on to four stars is the outcome of her decision to risk it all. Phillips is held by these Somali pirates, Michelle Howard is gathering all the resources, the Navy SEALs, the SEAL Team 6 has flown over, the high-end national mission folks. We've got destroyers, we've got a big deck amphib, a lot of command and control. We've got everything on station we need. Michelle Howard pulls all that together, and yet she has to make a very hard decision, and that is to take the shot to kill the Somali pirates because so often in these hostage rescues, they go very badly for the hostages. But she pulls it all together. She actually delegates that decision very sensibly to the destroyer captain. They pulled the trigger, three shots, three pirates dead, Captain Phillips rescued. Michelle Howard goes on to four stars. It's an example of when you are in that moment, if you can pull all the resources together and lead in that moment, which Michelle Howard really did, um, you can come out with a very successful outcome. So that's one of the decisions in the book that really turns out well for the protagonist. Well, I'm glad you grabbed the mic. That's, that's, I had Michelle Howard here. And I think she did all of that, not only with clarity of thought and decision-making uh, and strength, but also with great humility, as I as I read the rest of uh, the account of, of that of that passage. Correct. Let me tell you something about Michelle Howard in humility. When the book came out, a book agent called me and said, "Hey, Admiral, uh, you know, read the chapter on Michelle Howard. I, you know, I'd I'd really love to be in touch with her, and I bet she could do a book that would be amazing about." her experiences in Captain Phillips and her life experiences, being the first African-American woman to get to four stars. And, uh, and I said, sure, I'd, I'd love to see her do that. And I contacted Michelle and said, hey, this agent really wants to do this deal with you and help you tell your story. And Michelle Howard said, nope, yeah. I'm, I'm very comfortable with my life as it is. My story is out there. I'll let my my deeds and my career speak for themselves. And, you know, I deeply respect that. And, and it, it, it bespeaks the kind of kindness, humility, and thoughtfulness of someone like Michelle Howard. Admiral, before we go to Q&A here, I see Jackie is, is pulling us forward. You mentioned about John Paul Jones, we've just begun to fight. You had a great op-ed in USA Today on uh, President Zelensky. Uh, yeah. you, you refer to the quote, a dealer in hope. A leader has to be a dealer in hope. The courage of not only Zelensky, but the Ukrainian people. So speak briefly, if you will, then we'll go to 
Q&A with, with Jackie here about the Ukraine-Russia conflict, because it's obviously top of mind for us all. Indeed. And, and I think the book really illuminates not just Zelensky, but Putin as follows. Mm -hmm. um, here are two leaders who, in a sense, are risking it all. I mean, Putin has really rolled the dice here. And so far, it's not going well. And he has very little to show for this. Thousands of dead Russians, his flagship of the Black Sea at the bottom of the Black Sea, uh, international opprobrium. It is not going well for Vladimir Putin. And the reason is his recklessness, <clears throat> his ego, his isolation as a leader. It, it is a perfect example of someone who risks it all for the wrong reasons, for his or her ego. On the other hand, Volodymyr Zelensky is risking it all for all the right reasons. Zelensky, when he looks over his shoulder from the front lines where he goes as the president in his, <clears throat> in his tactical gear, I mean, that guy hasn't put on a suit in, in six months. When he looks over his shoulder, who does he see back there? He sees his wife, his yeah. children, his yeah. parents, yeah. the elders of Ukraine. He sees his civilization, his language, his cities. He sees everything behind him. He is risking it all on a daily basis for all the right reasons. And I'll close with this and then we can open it up. I think one line from Zelensky sums up the idea of to risk it all. At the start of the conflict, when many were predicting that the Russians would simply steamroll these Ukrainians, Zelensky was approached by the United States and told, let us get you out of there. We'll set up a government in exile for you, like Charles de Gaulle, when France fell in the Second World War. We'll, we'll put you on a helicopter. We'll give you a ride out of Ukraine. What did Zelensky say? He said, I don't need a ride. I need more ammunition. That's a guy, could be anybody, risking it all over his shoulder, all the right reasons. That's the essence of this book. Powerful, powerful, powerful. So Jackie, let me turn it to you on the questions. How, do you, how would you like us to proceed here? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That was a great conversation. It's very interesting um, listening to the two of you talk about this. So thank you. Um, we will now jump into the Q&A. So just a reminder, um, feel free to submit any questions using the webinars Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, but to start off with a question, um, you started talking about this a little bit, but what does the invasion of Ukraine mean to Europe? What do you think about Sweden and Finland <clears throat> joining NATO? Well, I am thrilled to see Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Um, I commanded their troops in Afghanistan. They deployed uh, to Afghanistan, the Balkans, Libya, alongside NATO. They are the closest of partners, friends. We exercise with the Finns and the Swedes. They deploy into combat with us. I know them very well. At one point, um, when I was in the Balkans, my security detail was provided by the Swedes. And by the way, I'm like five feet, five inches tall. The only person on this call I look up to, uh, or I don't look up to is, is there are no people I, I don't look up to. Um, and I'm surrounded by these six foot, three inch Vikings who are protecting me around the Balkans. I'll always remember that about the Swedes. The, the Finns have one of the largest armies in Europe, despite the fact that they're a small nation, they have universal conscription. They have mandatory two-week refresher training. The Finns, I would say, could put somewhere between 500,000 and a million troops into the field. That's remarkable, highly capable, more artillery pieces than any other nation in Europe. The Swedes, on the other hand, super high-tech. They build the Gripen fighter. It's in every way the equivalent of our magnificent U.S., uh, FNA 18 Hornet. Um, they make terrific diesel submarines. So with Finland and Sweden, you get two highly capable militaries who have now made the plunge. They will join NATO. 
President Erdogan of Turkey is putting a little sand in the gears, won't last. Sweden and Finland will be part of NATO. They'll become member states 31 and 32 for a total of 32, I would say by the end of the summer. Huge plus up for the alliance. Another big change in Europe, the Germans have finally woken up to the danger of Russia. And I'll tell you this, for four years as Supreme Allied Commander, every time I went to Berlin, paid a call on Chancellor Merkel, every time I went to a big NATO conference, went to a big NATO summit, you know, I didn't go talk to President Obama. I didn't go talk to President Sarkozy. I didn't talk to Prime Minister Cameron. I went right for Chancellor Merkel. And I would say, Madam Chancellor, you really need to increase your defense spending. And you're making, you know, from our perspective, don't get too dependent on Russian gas, Nord Stream 2 pipeline. You know, maybe not a good strategic idea. I'd do it very politely. She would basically pat me on the head and say, Admiral, you're a, you're a very nice officer and I'm very ha happy you're a Supreme Allied Commander of our alliance, but don't worry, we understand Russia much better than you do. Okay, um, so today we see the Germans turning off the taps to Nord Stream 2, recognizing you can't be dependent upon Russia and really understanding the wolf that lies at the heart of Vladimir Putin. And that's why they have doubled their defense budget in a single year. That's, that's pretty remarkable. That's another huge change. And then third and finally, you see Europe really unifying around this, uh, this threat from Vladimir Putin. And I'll close with this. You know, for Europe, Western Europe, when they see Russian tanks rolling west, it rattles old and dangerous ghosts. They remember the end of the Second World War, the Germans do, when the Red Army literally raped its way across Germany. They remember 1956 when Soviet tanks rolled into Budapest. They remember 68 when Soviet tanks rolled into the Czech capital of Prague and crushed the Prague Spring. They remember all of that. They remember what it's like to have a Russian boot on their throats. And they're not going back. That's the biggest change in Europe. Um, the days of, oh, we'll just figure it out and get along with Russia. I don't think that's happening at least as long as Vladimir Putin is in power. That's the biggest change in Europe, awareness. Wow, thank you. Um, that was captivating. <laughs> um, so we only have, time for about one more question. I want to make sure that we um, end on time here tonight. So you had said that in your mind, this book was part of a trilogy. So did you know when you were writing that first book, The Leader's Bookshelf, that you wanted um, you wanted to follow it with two more? And had you kind of had that plan in place of, you know, this is the story I want to tell? Or was that something that came you know, after you wrote the first book, you, you got the idea for the second, and then you saw, you know, I really can tie all three of these together with this, this most recent final book. No, I felt uh, from the beginning that ultimately I wanted to write three books about three different but very interrelated subjects. Mm -hmm. The first, The Leader's Bookshelf, then Sailing True North about character, and now to risk it all about decision making. I think those are the three things that really shape us as people. And I'm, I'm big on that idea of, of planning ahead, if you will. And um, in the world of fiction, if we can go over there for a second, um, my idea of 2034, a novel of the next world war is actually part of a trilogy. The second book, 2054, is about artificial intelligence set in the year 2054 and civil conflict in the United States. And the third book in that trilogy, 2074, is consumed with climate. So first one, China, second one, cyber, artificial intelligence, civil conflict, third one, climate. I think those are the three significant challenges of the 21st century. I've addressed those in fiction, over here on the nonfiction side, um, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do with these three books. And now I'm, I'm gonna continue to pursue um, fiction 
for the next couple of books. So stay tuned. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. You, you definitely achieved your goal. That's for sure. Uh, So thank you so much for spending time with us this evening. As a reminder, please consider purchasing your copy of To Risk It All from Bookhampton, RJ Julia, or Wesley and RJ Julia. Links can be found in the chat box. We truly appreciate you being with us tonight. And now I will hand it over to Mr. Mac McLarty for a final word and to close us out for the evening. Jackie, thank you very much. I would say do much more than consider. This is a must a must purchase and a must read book. Let me just make a couple of comments. First, uh, I'll really end as I began. It's been a, a, a treat and an honor, uh, Admiral, to be with you tonight. I think David, uh, David Ignatius's comment, this is a business school at sea, uh, was a great way to capture your book. We didn't get into how you center yourself for decision making and some of the steps, including execution. I wish we'd had time for that, but that's all the more reason to to buy the book. Uh, Secondly, I would say, despite your breadth and depth and statesmanship and experience and leadership and service to our country, you still have that South Florida common sense (laughs) and you're grounded and that's important. And your comment about sometimes you gotta know the difference between quitting and getting beat is just good plain common sense. And that just comes through in your personality. Remarkable balance and we look forward to your, your books ahead. Finally, I would just close with a brief grace note to uh, Carolyn Brody. Uh, I think Admiral Sabrita has captured it. Uh, book Hampton is a gem. It is an absolute gem and just such an encouragement uh, for good and, and uh, just, just really brings out the best in all of us. So Carolyn, thank you for your remarkable career and your contribution. It has just been a, a great pleasure to be with you tonight. With that, thank all of you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to the next session. You've got a sequel, and I suspect a trilogy ahead. With that <laughs> thank you and good night. Thanks, everybody. Great session. Thanks, Mac.